Well, good morning on this last Sunday in January. Uh, we've actually made it through the first month of 2021, no major disasters. So um, we're going to jump in this morning to just a, a singular talk that I wanted to do that kind of fits into what we've been talking about the past three weeks. But before I jump in, I do want to give you a heads up in case you don't hang around for the end of the sermon. I want to tell you uh, here at the beginning, uh, next Sunday, which is February the 7th, um, well, is going to be our, for our for 2021, it's going to be our first what we call Hands and Feet Sunday. Those are Sundays where uh, we don't gather online or in person, but we will be doing things from a distance and in person as we go out and serve and be kind of be that the hands and feet of Jesus. It's something we started when this church first started over six years ago, um, and it really uh, is a heartbeat of what we do. So next Sunday, there will not be an online service. We will be in the building in person, um, working and moving uh, forward and going out with our hands and feet Sunday. If, you would, if you'd like to participate in that, there'll be details throughout the week that we'll be posting on our social media platforms. If you'd like to participate in any of that, whether you have been involved with us in the past or not, we'd love to give you that opportunity. So if you see some of that information and want to respond to it, uh, we'd be honored for you to do so. So today, as I said, we're going to kind of do a kind of a singular message that, that I'm calling Getting to the Other Side. And it ties in with what we've been talking about for the past three weeks as we've talked about how we can be better for it, it being what we've gone through. In 2020, obviously, we've gone through this pandemic. Uh, a lot of you may have gone through some financial hardships, some health hardships, whatever it may be. Whatever we've recently gone through, we've talked about how we should be better for it and that it would be a shame not to gain from the pain that we've gone through and experienced. So today, I want to apply that same thought process to our church, this community of Jesus followers that we call Church at the Corner. And there's no doubt that we, along with every other church in the country, have gone through something we've never experienced before. I've yet to come across a pastor who's ever led a church through a pandemic because we hadn't had a pandemic in a hundred years. So this is all new to churches, pastors, and leadership. But even though it's new and we've experienced something we've never experienced before, as a church, we need to make sure that we are better for what we've gone through. We've had to learn to operate in a totally different way. And we need to be better because of that. Now, let's go back prior to the pandemic. And let's just be honest for a few minutes and make this statement. The church really, even prior to the pandemic and all this stuff that's unfolded, had been and was becoming more and more irrelevant in so many segments of our culture. So I think it's important and I think we need to talk about what we've learned because of that and then with what we've gone through so that we don't have to repeat the class again, especially as we cross over to the other side. I have said from the beginning, this is going to be a little bit of a critical statement, but I just I want to be truthful. I've said since the beginning of this pandemic, God didn't make this pandemic happen. But in the midst of it, he has a purpose for his church in the midst of it. And I've said from the beginning, unfortunately, that I think part of his purpose for the church has been to really see who's in and who's out. Who's committed to the mission of the church and who are just consumers and have been just consumers. I've kind of compared it to a, 
a, a boat that unties from a dock and it slowly drifts away to where you can't see it anymore. I honestly believe that part of God's purpose for his church through this pandemic and when we get to the other side has been to see who's really, really committed to the mission. And unfortunately, who's just been consumers. It's an ugly truth. It's a truth that I hate to even bring up, but it is a truth. You know, and another thing that I've, I think we've learned through this process is, is I've said this in the Better For It series of the previous three weeks, is aspiring to get back to normal is not very inspiring, especially if the normal prior to the pandemic, we were becoming less and less relevant in our culture. See, I, I think this focus that, we, that the church has always had about getting butts in the seats, filling auditoriums, and have whatever you want to say, that can't be the focus anymore. Well, I think we've learned that for sure as we move forward. I recently saw some information from a very well-respected pastor, a very well-respected leader in the Christian community, and some of his data that he's been gathering throughout 2020 from other leaders and other churches and people that are a whole lot smarter than I am. And he shared that recently uh, publicly, and he says in there that our mission cannot be to get people in, 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 in seats and in an auditorium anymore. Our mission has to be to engage people and connect people wherever they're at. And he said in his uh, story that he released on a podcast and in a blog that he really believes by the end of 2021 that people that are engaged and connected to the mission of the church that are outside of the building, that maybe don't come in the building hardly at all, will be more than those that are in the building that the scales are going to shift. So if that's the case, how do we do that? How do we make sure that we're, as we get to the other side, that we've learned what we need to learn and we're connecting and engaging people that are far from God? Because that's still the goal. And for that to happen, we really have to re remember and keep our eyes on the road and focus on the main thing. So if we're going to focus on the main thing, I think, and really be effective when we get to the other side of this, we need to start with this very profound but simple truth. And it's this right here. Christ came to seek and save the lost. I, it's simple, but it's profound. And then the part, next part of that is we his church, Jesus followers, are to be about the same thing. Christ came to seek and save the lost, and we are to be about the same thing. You know, when you really sit back and do a flyover of Jesus' earthly ministry, there's some interesting observations. I want to look at a couple of them and put them on the screen here. Here's, here's the first one. Jesus came as a religious leader but he spent little time with religious people. He was sent from God, but didn't really pursue godly people. People who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus, and he liked them back. Can that last statement be said about us? And then here's a, a second observation. Irreligious people love to hear him speak. In other words, people that were far from God, they'd love to listen to Jesus speak. The group that felt most uncomfortable at the temple, the institution, they felt uncomfortable at the institution, the church is an institution, they flocked to hear Jesus. They didn't flock to the institution or the building or what, they flocked to the person of Jesus to hear what the person of Jesus had to say. And people that weren't like Jesus liked him, and they liked him back. So 
Another simple but profound truth is this, if you've been around Christianity very long, and it's this, the church is his body. What's true of him should be true of us collectively. Our mission is to make that a reality. So that's why our mission at Church at the Corner is this right here. We want to change the way people view the church and inspire them to follow Jesus. You know, in my experience, a lot of people that are far from God don't necessarily have a problem with the person of Jesus. They have the problem with the entity, the church, the way they view the church. And that has become an obstacle in people being inspired to follow Jesus. And we are his body. We are the representation of Jesus on this earth. So why are people that aren't like us, why don't they like us? Why don't they want to be around us? I say this often. Jesus was the least judgmental person that ever walked the earth. But his body, his church, is known as the most judgmental. We've messed it up somewhere. So our mission here at Church at the Corner is we want to change the way people view the church. And we're willing to do anything we got to do short of sin to make that happen and inspire them to follow Jesus. That's the goal. That's the mission. That's, that's our focus. And in order for us to do that, we must resist the things as a church, his body, we must resist the things that make us resistible. Because apparently there's something that makes us resistible. People don't want anything to do with us. And one of the th places I think Jesus um, starts and we can learn from is that Jesus suggests that we begin by reprioritizing our adjectives. What do I mean by that? Well, if you just took a blank and then put the word people beside it, whatever you put into that blank is an adjective. And the way we use our adjectives, I think, is one of the things that draws people away from us. And Jesus helps us here. So what are your go-to adjectives when you describe people? People that are far from God, maybe. I mean, we all have them. Perhaps people who are nothing like Jesus liked him because of his adjectives. For that reason... I believe Jesus used parables to teach to the crowds because parables allowed him to use the right adjectives to make his point while at the same time not degrading anyone. And that's significant. So I think it'd be smart if that was the case that we look at a few of the parables that Jesus taught and see if we can emerge learn from those so we can emerge on the other side of what we've gone through better as a church. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 15. We're going to look at three parables here. And here's how it all starts in Luke 15 verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners, th those are adjectives, were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Again, there was something about Jesus that even these people would gather around to listen. They would lean in. But the Pharisees, we know were the religious people, and the teachers of the law, the religious people, muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. There's some adjectives again. You see, Jesus knew that both groups here really had the wrong adjectives when they described each other. Good people, bad people, whatever adjective you want to use. So then Jesus, with verse 3, kicks into three different parables. Two of them are about things that get lost, and one is about a disrespectful son. So let's flow through these and unpack them as we go. Verse 3 we're going to look at, but remember, who's Jesus' audience? We just saw it here in verses 1 and 2. Tax collectors, 
sinners, okay, religious leaders, the Pharisees, people that were far away from God. So Jesus explains as we get to verse 3. Then Jesus told this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Probably a very familiar group of verses here. You're familiar with, you may be very familiar with these parables. And again, we see three parables, going to be about two lost things and one disrespectful son. We've got the audience down. And then we go to verse four, five, and six. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Now, this is called the lost sheep parable. There's a real original name. But let me give you something to think about. When you lose something of value, is it right or wrong to focus on what's lost to the neglect of what's unlost? I mean, let's use a couple crazy examples here, but let's say somebody, you, you lost your engagement ring and you go to tell your your uh, fiance or um, your soon-to-be husband, bride, whatever. You say, but I lost my engagement ring, but I still got my cell phone, though. Or maybe you're somebody with multiple kids, and you, you're somewhere public, and you kind of lose track of one of them, and your wife comes to you and says, honey, what, where's, where's Joey at? And you say, well, I'm not sure, but... The others are right here. Well, think through that as we read on verse 7, and then I want to pick back up and unpack that a little bit more. Verse 7 says this, I tell you in the same, that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. So again, when you lose something valuable, it's not helpful to think about what you haven't lost. You need to focus on what you've lost. So we see here that all the men listening in the crowd, both sides, Pharisees, tax collectors, sinners, are probably shaking their head because they understand that you're to go after lost things with focus. Unlost things aren't that big a deal. Kind of like I said, hey, honey, I've lost one kid, but here I got the others. No, the lost thing is where you put your focus. Well, then we pick up with verse 8, and he goes a little further into this same thought process. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully? until she finds it. Now, you got to understand the culture a little bit here. I want to give you a little context here. Um, a woman that was betrothed to be married, engaged or whatever, would have a, a dowry handed down to them by her parents. And lots of times they were called engagement coins. And they were to be worn in some form or fashion until the, the marriage at which time then they were handed over to the husband. Uh, and a lot of them wore them in like headbands, um, different ways. But if you lost one of them, it would be like losing your engagement ring. And you, and you didn't dare leave home without it. You had to have all of them in there. So again, the analogy here in the context is they un the, the crowd understood what he was talking about because if a woman lost one of those cones, she wasn't going to leave her home. She couldn't leave her home without it because she that showed that she was engaged, just like wearing an engagement ring. And she would do everything she could to find that lost coin. She would sweep the house and search carefully. And then verse 9, it says, And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, 
I have found my lost coin. Can you imagine the satisfaction, the relief, the peace, the gratitude that would come by finding that? Because this was so significant. You see, when we lose something of great value, you go to great lengths to find it. A lot of you women get that more so than men do. But what's, what's Jesus, what's he talking about really here in this parable? Well, we see two adjectives, which are really important. Lost, not lost. What's that telling us? Jesus is teaching here, you, you're to only put people into two categories. Those are the only adjectives you're to have. The rest of the adjectives, throw them out the window. They're either lost or they're saved. They're either lost or they're not lost. Those are, those, are, those are the only two adjectives we get as Jesus followers. Je Jesus hasn't lost track of sinners. And see, this isn't about knowing where somebody is spatially. It's about knowing where somebody is relationally. And that's what Jesus is emphasizing here. So then he moves on to a story of a father whose youngest son couldn't wait for dad to die. He wanted his inheritance. He wanted his money. And we're going to work our way down to kind of the ending of the story. But I want to give you a little information before we get there. This story is about a father who's lost his relationship with his son. And what you find there when you read is that the son was gone relationally before he ever left the home, the space. He was already gone relationally. And then the father wanted to reconnect to him so much that he chose what he thought would be the shortest route back. He was going to let the son go, but I, he said, I got to do something that might cause the shortest route back. So he funds financially. He gives the, the son the money that would have been his if he'd already died. Now, when the audience heard this, they probably thought this father was a fool. But the father was willing to lose him to win him. And eventually, we read there, the son is overwhelmed by the realization that he's disconnected. He's lost in his world. He was missing home and wondering if home was missing him. And then we pick up with verse 20 in Luke 15. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with with compassion for him. He ran to his son, he being the father, threw his arms around him and kissed him. See, when he saw his son at the same distance leaving with his back turned, he didn't run after him. He didn't go after him and throw his arms around him. Why? Well, Jesus' point here is, is God desires relationship, connection, not a GPS coordinate. He desires that we go, we, we know that, we, we let them know that we care, but they have to come. And that's what we see here in this story. It says, and he kissed him. I'm sure that as he was telling the story, the audience probably gagged because if you read earlier, the, the adjectives here that they were probably thinking is, well, the son was probably dirty. He was unacceptable. But the father saw him as clean and acceptable. Those are different adjectives. Verse 21, it says, the son said to him, father, uh, where are we at here? Yeah, the son said to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Look at the adjectives here. He was dead. He's alive. He was lost. He's found. He was disconnected. Now he's connected. That's the way Jesus sees people. Is that the way we see them? Or do we come up with our other go-to adjectives? Guys, all that matters is that they're either lost or they're found. They're either disconnected or connected. They're either dead or alive in Christ. See, here's his point. Boy, uh, this is so simple but so profound. Here's this principle we want to put up here. The reason Jesus prioritized people disconnected from God was because they were disconnected from God. It's not rocket science. The reason Jesus prioritized people disconnected from God is because they were disconnected from God. You see, God views people, just like we saw in the parable, as either sheep or a coin. That's lost. God views separated people like they are a sheep or a coin. See, he views them as something of great value that is lost. We stay at arm's length from them. Nope. The reason Jesus was so focused on sinners is because he felt as if he had lost them and was looking for them. Do you feel that way? Do you look at somebody that doesn't know Jesus as though you've lost them and you've got to do everything you can to look for them so they can be found? So I've got three questions that I want us to apply from what we've talked about today. And they all center around initially this thought process. The gravitational pull of the church is always toward the paying customer, the connected, and the 99. You realize that, don't you? Look at what the church does most of the time. We got Well, we got to get everybody back in the auditoriums. Well, it's... it's Data showing that close to 30 to 40 percent of the people that used to show up on a Sunday morning before COVID aren't coming back. They're not coming back. So that means their lost friends aren't going to probably come in this building. And so much of what we've done in the past, when even prior to COVID, when we were being irrelevant, to be honest with you, in our culture, was all about the paying customer. Those already connected, the 99, the focus, the gravitational pull was to look in, not out. I've said this ever since we moved into this building. I love the fact that we got all these windows on the front. It's a big open in this shopping center because it reminds me all the time of what we're supposed to be focused on. It's what's outside the windows. So will that be our focus as we get to the other side? Or are we going to be better? for what we've gone through and what we've learned? Or will we just focus and be like, like we've always done? The gravitational pull is to be inward focused. See, we run the risk of misprioritizing our adjectives if we do that. We use the terms good, bad, conservative, liberal, young, old. See, my only fear for our first six and a half years has been that we won't be that, we, we will no longer be a church that will continue to be more about who's not here than who is here. My fear has been we would become more about who is here. And to be honest with you, through COVID as a pastor, that's been my focus. And I, I messed up. My focus shouldn't be who's here. It should be who's not here. 
the lost, the disconnected, the dead to Christ. Another question is this, will we lose our concern for disconnected people? Have we lost our concern for disconnected people through this? <laughs> Baptisms are down dramatically in the church right now through 2020. You say, well, that makes sense. I mean, we been, hadn't been able to meet. No, 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 no. Showing up on a Sunday morning doesn't save somebody. It's a heart for somebody that's lost and can, and can be saved at their kitchen table. Have we lost or will we lose our concern for disconnected people? And then here's, here's the million dollar question. Do we really even care? Do we really even care that that guy's lost? That young girl's disconnected. That young man's dead to Christ. Do we really even care? You know, what's interesting is we only clap and throw parties and shoot confetti for baptisms. Isn't that interesting? For that freshly connected person. Man, we should be throwing lots of confetti around. We should run out of confetti poppers monthly. Number three, are we more concerned about who we are reaching or who we are keeping? Boy, I tell you, as a pastor, it's, hard, it, it's really easy to be focused on this. Let me explain what I mean here. Guys, I'm, I've never led a church through a pandemic. I did everything I could to try to keep people connected from a distance. I'd send out text messages to some of our folks and check on them. Never hear a word back. No response at all. Breaks my heart. But at some point in time, if there's no response, I can't be focused on keeping because our goal is reaching. We need to reach people that are lost, disconnected, dead to Christ. So, are we more concerned about keeping some of us that have wanted to rush to get back to the building? Are we more concerned about keeping or are we more concerned about reaching and engaging and connecting? And then here's the last question. When you create a culture of reaching, it's not a question, it's a statement, you will attract the connected as well as the disconnected. When you create a culture of of reaching, and you only put people in two buckets, lost or found, you will attract the connected as well as the disconnected. And that's our goal. That's what we're going to do here. We're going to try to change the way people view the church so they can be inspired to follow Jesus. We're going to only look at people that, through two lenses, lost or found, period. And we're going to create ways to engage and connect to them and not worry and focus on trying to get them in this building. We want to help transform their lives. It doesn't matter where that's done and what that looks like. We're going to let them know we love them. We're going to let them know we're for them. We're going to engage and connect to them. We're going to create context where they feel comfortable stepping into it. And we can rub a little Jesus against them and just let him do what only he can do. So, kind of got an unchurched church checklist I want to walk through with you as we talk about getting to the other side. Here's the first thing. I didn't put these on the screen. Um, they'll be in your notes that you can download on the Uversion app. Um, the unchurched checklist is what's intuitive for one generation is quickly lost by the next generation. See, to constantly be thinking about those disconnected those unchurched, those lost, we have to realize that what's intuitive for one generation is quickly lost probably by the next generation in translation. So it's important to remember that and be sensitive to that. Here's another one. We, we must continue to try to do things where we're not resistible and that we 
gravitate towards insider thinking. And if we constantly think about the unchurched, the disconnected, it will allow us to do that. We'll analyze and go, you know what? That makes us resistible. We, can, we don't need to do that. That, that. that looks as though our whole gravitational pull is for people that are here already. We don't need to be doing that. And that's the lens we're going to look at things through. We need to continue to assume that the lost, the one sheep, the lost coin, whatever, that they're in the room, whether it's on a Sunday morning in a building or some other context we create during the week, watching online, we need to assume that they're there and not forget that. That's why we do some things like telling you up front, today we're going to be here for about 50 minutes. That's why we don't pass an offering plate if you come to our in-person service and numerous other things that we've decided to do that we think make us resistible. Another thing is, is, and this is so important, guys, we need to continue to show respect for the views and values of those who don't share our views and values. If we were to line 10 people up, up against a wall, you would have 10 different views and values. That's just the world we're living in today. So everything somebody does makes perfect sense to them. And we need to continue to grant people permission to explore their faith no matter what their views and values are. And if we look at it from that perspective, we wind up not using some of the adjectives we've always used. Liberal, conservative, you know, whatever it may be, left, right, whatever. And then we've talked about this over and over and over, but this is going to, I think, be so significant as we move forward. We've got to let people follow and belong before they believe anything. That's what Jesus did. He never told those 12 to believe in him. He just said, follow him. And they became a part of something. And along the way, they came to believe in him. See, we've conveyed this message that you got to believe what we believe before you can hang out with us and belong. And that's so far from what Jesus taught and what Jesus modeled. The other thing is, is we got to continue to main, maintain a good reputation in our community. That's where we embrace this four, F-O-R, this four mentality, because we believe for far too long, the church has been known for what it's against. The church should be known for what it's for. We are for this community. We are for you as an individual. And we want to do everything we can in this community to let people know that. And you're going to see a lot more about that because that's one of the ways we're going to be able to engage and connect. And it doesn't matter if they wind up sitting in one of these seats or not. And then the last thing is, is we're going to be rich. Let's be rich. What do I mean by that? Let's be present in people's lives. Let's be available. Let's slow down so we can be available. Let's be seen doing good. Let's, you don't let, let's don't let our lack of financial resources individually and as a church keep us from doing good and being generous. We as Jesus followers should be the most generous people on the planet. Whether it's helping an organization, whether it's helping an individual and supporting your local church. We should be the most generous people on earth. So, I want to conclude with this. Have you ever lost something of great value to you? I've heard stories of people having a, uh, especially women wa washing dishes or in the shower and the diamond fall off of their ring and go down the drain. Man, I've, I've heard people go to some extremes to get in there and get it because they've lost it. So if you ever lost something of great value to you, but nobody but you is looking for it, let's not be that church. Let's not be those people as we venture to the other side. Let's keep our adjectives straight and proper. 
Let's be the father in the parable. And let's be better as we get to the other side. Let's be better for what we have gone through. Wouldn't it be a shame not to gain from the pain? And guys, more than anything else, let's keep our eyes on the road and the main thing. Let me pray. Father, I, as I thought through what you inspired me to teach today and worked on it a little bit and, and saw just some very simple but profound truths that we just forget, that Jesus came to seek and save the lost, and we're, just, we're to be about the same thing. That's the only, that was his only focus, and that we are his body. And we are to look at people only in two ways. They're either lost or they're found. They're disconnected or connected. They're dead to you or alive to you. And that's it. That's what you called us to do. We are your body. We are your representation. And, oh, Father, I'm, my heart's broken. And I'm, I'm, I'm so ashamed of myself for letting, through this pandemic especially, letting all that get away from me and from, from us as a body, a community of believers. We've been so focused on ourselves through all this. And there's been a lot of people die through this process without Jesus. Boy, that should break our hearts. And it should inspire us and fuel us to make sure that we change that as much as possible as we get to the other side. Help us to be better for it. Help us to view people the way you view people. And then it's pretty simple after that. So, Father, we thank you and we praise you in the name of Jesus who makes all this possible. Amen.